The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating. Before we get started, uh, we would like to do a sound check to make sure that people who are on the webinar can hear me talking. If you can hear me, if you can raise your hand, um, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Welcome and thank you for attending the Colorado Medical Board stakeholder meeting via webinar today. Before we get started, we would like to introduce the staff members from the Division of Professions and Occupations that are present. My name is Darcy Magnuson and I am a regulatory analyst with the division. Also present is Paula Martinez, the program director for the Colorado Medical Board, and Elena Kemp, regulatory coordinator, and Sam Delt, senior program director. We will be facilitating this stakeholder meeting. Due to concerns regarding COVID-19, the division has transitioned to a platform that is 100% virtual, and we appreciate your flexibility. As many of you have been to DORA stakeholder meetings before, we would like to reiterate the importance of your comments today. DORA makes decisions every day that may affect your life and your business, so your input is vital in the rulemaking process. Throughout this process, our goal is to create regulations that clarify and explain legislation, ensure minimum competency to enter and continue to practice, and provide only what is absolutely necessary for consumer protection without creating unnecessary barriers to the marketplace. Your input will be part of the information that goes to the board as it considers adopting revisions to the rules, more specifically, we will be discussing revisions to Rule 120, 3 CCR 71322 to implement Colorado House Bill 2013-26 concerning an expansion of an individual's ability to practice an occupation in Colorado through creation of an occupational credential portability program. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the board's website by the end of business tomorrow. As this stakeholder meeting is held solely by webinar, Please you raise your hand by using the hand icon if you would like to speak, and we will unmute your line so you'll be heard by everyone. Or you can type your comment in the question section and we, and we will read it aloud. For anyone that is planning to provide comments, please state your name and who you represent. Feel free to provide either general comments on the rule changes or specific comments on the proposed language. Keep your comments limited to three to five minutes or less, and try not to repeat something that was already said. Stating you're in full agreement with someone else works just fine and will be noted. If you are using uh, the audio through your computer, please remember to put any phones on vibrate or turn them off. And whether you are using computer or phone audio, try to keep background noises to a minimum when speaking. So at this point in time, um, we are showing the draft version of the rules on the screen um, with comments that are targeted toward um, stakeholders. So if you would like to provide any comments, now is your opportunity to do that. And like I mentioned, you can do that by raising your hand and we'll unmute your line, or you can type in written comments and we can read those out loud. So the first person that I see um, with a raised hand is Heidi Warner. Heidi Warner, you are self-muted. If you unmute on your end, we should be able to hear you. Heidi Warner. Sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand for that. I was just raising my hand that I could hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. I will lower your hand and place you back on mute. If you want to speak, just let us know. Um, I show Mark Fogg has a, his hand raised. Mark Fogg, we should be able to hear you. Yeah, I had the same thing. So Sierra Ward is going to speak on our behalf. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't see that CR Ward's hand is raised. Okay, there it is now. Okay, you are unmuted. We should be able to hear you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, is there any time limit to my comments? Uh, we Ideally, three to five minutes um, is what we try to keep it limited to so that we can get to everyone. Sure, thanks. Um, as, as you've already indicated, my name is Sierra Ward, and I'm a healthcare attorney here in Colorado. 
Uh, the purpose of my comments today is to address the impact of uh, House Bill 2013-26 and the proposed rulemaking on physician to practice administrative medicine. As we indicated in the written materials that we submitted, my firm represents clients who have faced barriers to licensure here in Colorado due to the fact that they practice administrative medicine. Uh, rather than providing direct patient care, these physicians are focused on broader scale issues such as population health, improving access to health care, optimizing health care delivery, et cetera. The problem we're facing is that the medical board will not give these administrative medicine uh, practitioners a Colorado license unless they either, one, undergo a competency assessment involving direct patient care, even if they don't intend to treat patients, or two, they enter into a public discipli disciplinary stipulation that restricts their practice. This is in contrast to how the medical board treats all other physician applicants who are granted full and unrestricted licenses. This distinction is neither required nor is it specifically authorized by any existing statute or rule. This practice of restricting administrative medicine physicians comes from the board's interpretation of active practice, which was a requirement for licensure by endorsement prior to the new house bill. The board interprets active practice to require direct patient care. So even administrative medicine physicians who are actively practicing administrative medicine are not given an unrestricted license. However, this definition of active practice does not exist in statute, in rule, or even in policy. Now, it's really important to note that the board is treating administrative medicine physicians differently than physicians who practice in every other context. By way of example, the board wouldn't require an actively practicing out-of-state primary care provider to undergo a competency assessment or to limit her practice to primary care by a public disciplinary stipulation. The board trusts physicians, patients, credentialing bodies, and its own regulatory authority to ensure that PCPs practice within their scope and that they don't attempt to provide services beyond their expertise. Similarly, the board doesn't impose any requirements on administrative medicine physicians who have maintained an active licensure in the state. Administrative medicine physicians who renew their licenses biannually are not subject to the same requirements as new applicants. Only new applicants will have, have their licenses restricted, even if they've continued to engage in a practice that is identical to that of an existing licensee. These barriers are making it more difficult for administrative medicine specialists to practice in the state. Accepting a restricted license will result in a report to the National Practitioner Data Bank and it may subject physicians to scrutiny in other states where they hold licenses. Many administrative medicine physicians require a full and unrestricted license, as does board certification, including board certification in administrative medicine. Because of these barriers, fewer administrative medicine expert, experts are able to obtain a license and practice in the state, which is detrimental to all Coloradans. Uh, most importantly for today's purposes is that uh, these barriers to entry are directly contrary to the purpose of House Bill 2013-26. The legislative declaration specifically states that the purpose of the bill is to reduce barriers to entry and that skilled professionals should be granted a license for substantially equivalent experience unless the regulator can demonstrate a specific reason to withhold the license. There is no justifiable reason to withhold unrestricted licenses from administrative medicine practitioners. We trust the system to ensure that all other types of physicians will remain within their scope. The best evidence that administrative medicine physicians can also be trusted is the fact that there are already fully licensed administrative medicine physicians in the state. These licensees have certainly not created any public safety concerns by virtue of maintaining their license, and the medical board has not sought to impose any restrictions on them. Now, we appreciate that the proposed revisions to Rule 120 recognize this issue and attempt to address it. However, the revisions fall far short of what we're asking for and what's in the best interest of Colorado. Current law does not prohibit the full and unrestricted licensure of administrative medicine physicians who are appropriately qualified in their field. While the proposed revisions ensure that the restricted license is non-disciplinary, the restriction does not eliminate reporting requirements or address the issue of job requirements or board certification. This is a huge disincentive to accepting a license in Colorado. 
as I discussed previously, administrative medicine physicians are given restricted licenses in Colorado because the board equates active practice with direct patient care. Importantly, House Bill 2013-26 specifically eliminates the requirement for active practice for applicants by endorsement, meaning that there is no basis under current law to restrict out-of-state applicants at all. While the statute does still require that applicants for reinstatement demonstrate active practice in the last two years, there is no requirement that the applicant demonstrate active practice that involves patient care. So even with this active practice requirement, the board should grant unrestricted licenses to reinstatement applicants who are actively engaged in the practice of administrative medicine or can otherwise demonstrate competency. What we're asking the board to do is to promulgate regulations that are consistent with House Bill 2013-26, to create rules that reduce barriers to entry and allow physicians to practice administrative medicine and who have the appropriate qualifications and experience in that field to obtain a full and unrestricted license in the state. Thank you uh, for those comments. Um, we did receive your written comments as well on this proposed rulemaking. Do you have suggested language that you would like to see added to the draft rules based on your, well, your think, feedback? Sure, I, I think it could be handled in a couple of different ways. Uh, one would just be to eliminate that last sentence where it talks about providing uh, uh, an order for physicians to, an order, uh, excuse me, an order restricting uh, physicians to the practice of administrative medicine, and it could just be dealt with, you know, on the basis of, of current statutes uh, and regulations. The alternative would be to build in uh, specific continued competency requirements um, for, you know, for physicians who aren't engaged in active practice of administrative medicine. Uh, because they are somewhat different than somebody who's involved in patient care. Uh, but I, I don't actually think that there needs to be anything specific in the regulations to, to um, address the situation that, that we're discussing here today. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and place you back on mute and lower your hand. Um, if you want to add anything else, feel free to raise your hand again. And I'm monitoring to see if we have any other individuals who <clears throat> have indicated that you would like Ms. Ward. I see your hand is raised again, so I'm going to un you're unmuted. Ms. I thought I put my hand. I thought I put my hand down. I apologize, <laughs> but I, I you could have said that I was putting it down at the same time. <laughs> oh, that's you're, that's certainly possible. Uh, I believe there's a, a Dr. Anderson on who would like to speak. I don't know if she's been able to raise her hand or not. She, I saw her hand briefly raised, Leisha Anderson. I can go to her next. Yeah, that. Dr. Leisha Anderson, you are unmuted on our end and self-muted on your end. If you would like to speak, um, just go ahead and unmute and we should be able to hear you, Dr. Leisha Anderson. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Oh, great. We can hear you. I'm sorry. Um, thank you. No I'm sorry for that. Um, my audio issues there. Um, so thank you for your time today. My name is Leisha, Dr. Leisha Anderson. Um, I earned my medical degree from Duke University School of Medicine in 1998, and I completed my pediatric residency at St. Louis Children's Hospital from 1998 to 2001. I became board certified in general pediatrics in 2001, and since that time I've maintained board certification, which is the demonstration of advanced knowledge and learning via a formal maintenance of certification program. I regularly attend medical educational sessions. I accrue continuing medical education credits. I also earned my master's degree in public health, or MPH, in 2018, 
to allow me to better understand the complexities of population health. I'm a avid continued learner, and I take great pride in excelling in my medical field. As a pediatrician, my professional path started in the conventional way. I worked as a primary care pediatrician at outpatient offices in St. Louis, and later after a move in Colorado Springs. While providing direct patient care at my outpatient offices, I took note of systematic inefficiencies. I noticed ways that my patient population might benefit from optimization of our office protocols and system. I also became aware of ways that our current systems might cause harm, such as over-prescribing over antibiotics. I became increasingly focused on the pursuit of upstream systems to prevent the downstream adverse childhood health consequences. With a unique understanding of the issues, I made the decision to tra transition away from direct patient care and fully commit my professional time to supporting systematic improvements in the delivery of pediatric care. My contribution as a pediatrician shifted from seeing 25 patients a day to focusing on ways to optimize the health of the larger pediatric population. I sought to improve structural frameworks in order to benefit pediatric office efficiencies and effectiveness, and ultimately to improve the health and safety of the larger pediatric population. I traded the one-on-one -on -one care of patients for the pursuit of population health. To that end, my current roles include coaching pediatricians and practice level quality improvement efforts to enhance the health and safety of their pediatric patients, such as reducing the overuse of antibiotics for ear infections and strep throat and improving adolescent vaccination rates. I've co-led several research papers to better understand the upstream interventions with the potential to improve the health of the pediatric population such as an evaluation of the leading contributors to early childhood obesity in Latino communities and an evaluation of childhood uh, or child care medical exclusion policies to reduce the frequency of unnecessary exclusion. And I've developed an extensive supply of family-facing content to enrich the availability of child-focused anticipatory health guidance, such as the development of a curriculum for new mothers to provide interactive education on topics related to the promotion of healthy newborn development, and content writing for a free texting platform devoted to supporting the health and welfare of families with children prenatal through age eight. I'm submitting this statement today because I feel strongly that Colorado needs a better way to meet the licensure needs of providers like myself. I continue to meet the American Board of Pediatrics criteria for clinical competency in general pediatrics, and I've never required disciplinary action. And I work full time to maintain the health of the pediatric population. And while Colorado's administrative license aligns with my scope of work and medical licensure maintains my, my eligibility to continue undergoing regular testing to prove my clinical competence and to retain my pediatric board certification, Colorado's administrative licensure as currently written also aggregates me with clinicians in need of disciplinary action or those who have shown evidence of clinical incompetency. I feel like this aggregation is unjustified and in need of modification. Without an expansion of the current occupation credentialing standards, Colorado's administrative license will fail to distinguish a pediatrician like myself from someone who has faced a conviction, disciplinary, or other adverse action. If the practice of medicine is defined as the application of medical or surgical efforts for the purpose of preventing, relieving, or curing disease, or reducing the impact of physical injury, then my upstream-focused work with maintenance of clinical acumen should be distinguished from those who have been unprofessional, immoral, or lack competency. Please consider revisions to Rule 120 so that well-trained, upstanding medical providers can continue our work to improve the population level health of Coloradans. Thanks. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and place you back on mute and then if you, and lower your hand, if you wanna talk again, just raise your hand. So far, we have not received any um, written comments. Sierra Ward, I see your hand is up again. I, so I've unmuted you. Uh, we should be able to hear you, Sierra Ward. I apologize. I was attempting to put my hand down again, but I, I will just okay, follow sorry. up briefly while, while I'm okay. unmuted. Uh, you, you would ask me earlier about whether it, you know, I had any specific uh, proposals for language, and, and I, I don't today. I mean, I can certainly provide some if that would be uh, would be helpful. I, you know, I, as I indicated, I don't think that this necessarily has to represent a change from existing law, but I do think it would probably be worthwhile putting in regulation or policy that uh, an administrative medicine practitioner will be granted an unrestricted license. Uh, so long as they're able to just show prior practice in administrative medicine and 
you know, they meet all the other qualifications of licensure. But I'm certainly happy to okay. submit specific uh, language if that's helpful. I, I do think that's helpful um, for the board to consider uh, while the board is, is looking at these proposed changes. Um, and then that also solidifies essentially your comments, right? And how they would be reflected in the proposed rules. So I personally think it's sure. helpful and then the board can take a look at it. And should I submit those directly to you or is there the email address for rulemaking, the general one, is that the best place to send it? Yes, the, the same email that you um, sent your other comments to works great. And so for Perfect. everyone who's part, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, was, I thought you were done, I apologize. No, I was just gonna say that it's, the email address is on all of our notices. So uh, for anyone else who wants to submit written comments, it's the same email address and it's Dora underscore DPO underscore rulemaking at state.co.us. Perfect, we will do that. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anyone else um, with a raised hand, and we haven't received any written comments. I want to make sure that we're not having any technical issues with uh, hand raising, so we will go ahead and pause for a couple minutes until 1.24 and keep monitoring so there will be silence. Um, and then we will move forward with the meeting if no one else wants to provide any feedback. Hi, this is Elena. Oh, sorry, Darcy. I just wanted to make sure that my comments were reflective of what the stakeholders were expressing. Um, so if Dr. or even Ms. Sierra Ward or um, Dr. Anderson, if you can just make sure, um, if you can look at the comment, because the board will see this and they will actually uh, be reviewing this webinar recording as well. So your comments will be heard. But just for a quick review, I just wanted to make sure that I've captured everything in, in the comments section correctly. Looks like we do have a question. Um, so this is a written comment received by Randolph Mal. I would echo the prior argument as I have had 27 years in emergency medicine and now work in ad admin as CMO. And that was received by Mr. Randolph Mall. Thank you. We have another hand raised by Mr. Fogg. I'm going to unmute your line.
Hello. Thank you. Thank you for unmuting me. Yeah. So I, I saw the line get unmuted. Um, so Elena, the only thing I perhaps would add uh, on that, you said consider revisions concerning administrative medicine, physicians, and licensing restrictions. Suggest that allowing an unrestricted license, if physicians can show continued competency, maybe add in administrative medicine. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think that makes it very clear. Thank you. Because, you know, one of the problems that Sierra put in our comments is CPEP doesn't have any testing on that. But if we can show the competency, which a number of docs can, that's kind of where we're headed. So we'll get you some specific language for the role. Thank oh, you. Perfect. Thank you. Got a couple more written comments received by Ms. Sierra Ward. Um, the first comment says, it should not reference continued competency. It should say provided the applicant meets all other requirements of licensure. So to be specific, and this comment is from Mr. Ralph Mall. So to be specific, would that competency be reflected in the tenure or would the length of service? All right, I currently don't see any other hands raised or any other written comments. Okay, I will go ahead and wrap up then. Thank you again for participating in today's meeting. The stakeholder comments and program recommendations will be presented to the board um, at the board's next meeting this month, full board meeting. And then the rulemaking hearing is tentatively scheduled for November 18th of 2021. Um, as a reminder, you can always access all of the uh, rulemaking activity, proposed rulemaking, rulemaking activity on the board's website under the public notices tab um, and there is that is where you'll be able to access the recording from today's meeting the draft rules notices of upcoming activity including stakeholder meetings and rulemaking hearings um, you can also look on the board's calendar um, and that ha will have the same thing the notice the draft rules the act the webinar links all of that information um, and then throughout this entire process, you are always welcome to submit written comments to the rulemaking inbox that we mentioned earlier. We include that on all of the communication that's sent out to stakeholders and licensees. And that is Dora underscore DPO underscore rulemaking at state.co.us. So with that, um, that concludes the stakeholder meeting for today. And we are going to end the webinar now.